Welcome to Wine Country at Work. I'm Ralph Demetrius. In 2017, fires roared through the North Bay forests, destroying thousands of homes, blanketing the region with smoke and becoming California's deadliest fire. In 2018, that was eclipsed by the Camp Fire, 100 miles to the northeast. Millions in the Bay breathed smoke for weeks from what became the new, deadliest fires. Seeking solutions, we asked people how it impacted them. I noticed that uh, it was bringing me down way more than it was my friends and co-workers, and I couldn't understand why I had uh, a special sensitivity to the smoke, but I definitely did. Mm. In the fires uh, in 2017, right. we, my husband and I and our cats were evacuated for uh, just about a week and it was a mandatory evacuation. And, uh, you know, we loaded up the car in the middle of the night and fled and didn't know if there'd be a home in the morning. We rode back in the morning to see, and it was still there, and we just continued pulling things out of the house, just not sure if the fires would come to mm. us. And uh, thankfully, our home was spared. Mm. And we finally got back in about a week after, and we, we still didn't have water uh, or gas because um, our gas lines and water lines are the same lines as the Silverado Country Club, which was largely burned down. And so they weren't able to turn our utilities fully back on for a couple more days, uh, even after we got back in the house. Mm. Very fortunate that my parents, uh, they live elsewhere in Napa, not very far from us, just right mm. on the valley floor right. where it was not in immediate danger. So we right. felt we could be safe right. there with them. And so we had mm. a little family reunion and yes. Peter and I celebrated our wedding anniversary you know, just sitting in my parents' kitchen. We had bigger plans for that day, but I think the day actually worked out pretty well. It was very thought-provoking. I mean, for me, this is a bellwether, and we've had warnings for 50 years, and now we have in our face disaster after disaster. Our fire, their floods, disasters, fires in Sweden, fires in all sorts of places, and events we haven't seen with typhoons and hurricanes. They're all related to global climate change. Well, we've known that. So what's it going to take to get us to wake up? I mean, we have the solutions right here. Like, for instance, in California, with all the homes rebuilding, all the public facilities, we should be thinking, how do we make those sustainable? How do they sustain us and avoid burning carbon? How do we build these things so in the next fire we have uh, some resiliency so our fire and police have power, uh, so our homes may have power? That's the new design. And put uh, for both your residents and for your community, particular community infrastructure that's really needed in a uh, disaster. Why will we have something that creates the same problem? Why we build the same way? Yet nobody seems to be taking that seriously and building in sustainable closed loop circles versus open sewer systems, which is more or less all of our utilities, all our food system, they're, they're really not sustainable. Okay, so for me, um, it started the year before when I actually had to get evacuated and the smell of the smoke was really interesting because I had a feeling it was just not going to be a good thing. And to smell smoke where I am at, I, I live up in the country, it's, um, it's something that causes alarm because it's surrounded by the trees and seeing how dry that the uh, California has become. So that smoke really concerned me and sure enough, when the fires actually came to Napa, it seemed to cause a, um, a, a um, PTSD. That period was, um, it was really depressing. That was the first time experiencing the fire and the heavy smoke like that in Napa. Um, to the point where I had to actually get out of, go down to the ocean up in Fort Bragg just to get away for three days because the smoke was affecting my lungs. Uh, I was so tired. The fatigue was something I just couldn't quite put my finger on. Like, how does smoke make me tired? But it did. Um, sometimes it just felt like I could barely lift my head. Um, just, just crippling fatigue and uh, mental uh, fuzziness and, and like a foggy feeling in my mind. Um, and breathing was, uh, I could feel the scratchiness in my throat. Uh, kind of got a little, developed a little cough during that time. I uh, wasn't sleeping quite properly. 
and I started wearing the mask because we had the masks left over from the previous year's fires, mm -hmm. and I would very diligently wear them when I went outside, and I couldn't understand how other people were not wearing them because it was affecting me so much. Uh, and you're in the tour business. How did the, the, the presence of the fire and the smoke affect your business? Well, it was interesting. The day that that actually happened, uh, th three Thursdays ago, I can remember I was up at O'Shaughnessy up on, uh, on uh, Hell Mountain, and it was a beautiful day, and I'm looking southwest, and suddenly, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, there's this, this dampening, this horrible darkness, and it's like a tsunami had just come overhead. Well, the Santa Ana winds were blowing from the northeast to the southwest, which is contraflow, and suddenly, within 30 minutes, you couldn't see 200 yards. And that's from a fire. I mean, of course, we went through the fires last year. I'm saying, what's burning? Hell Mountain, uh, wineries in, in, in the vicinity? That fire was 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it had started two hours before. Mm -hmm. So the amount of, of smoke that was coming in was, was staggering. And literally from that moment on, uh, people were calling and saying, uh, we've, we've seen this on TV. We don't know what, what the condition is. Should I come? Should I not? You know, should we bring gas masks or, or whatever? At that point, you could say, well, from a safety standpoint, the valley is not threatened by that, like it, certainly like it was a year before in, uh, in 2017. But that compounding with what had happened 12 months before just spooked people again. And, and we saw a drop off of business. I mean, our business... We, we drive wine tours. My wife and I have two cars. We've been doing this for 10 years. Um, and most of our, well, all of our business is either repeat or referral. So we're booking out months and months in advance sometimes. So it didn't impact our business because we really didn't have that many um, last minute guests who were saying, well, should I come next week? And they go, what's, all, what's with all the fires? But the impact certainly reminded us from 12 months ago when uh, my wife and I, as I said, with, with two cars, our October last year was going to be our, our biggest month on record. We had 38 wine tours booked, which is a ton of work for us to be doing. And literally, the fires started on the 8th of October. And by the end of that month, we had done eight of those 38. Everyone else had canceled. People were calling us from across the country saying, where, 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 are, you, where are you eating? Where are you sleeping? Where are you getting your food and gas? And now that nap is burned to the ground. Unfortunately, there was a, a, a video of, of, um, of a winery in Stag's Leap that suddenly, by the morning of the first day, was totally engulfed. It looked like Dresden bombing in, in World War II. And that was the image that went out across the country. And, and literally, there's still people who are calling me 12 months later saying, um, have you rebuilt? Uh, I said, well, it, it was close for us. We were very, very close to one of the six fires. Uh, and there was a tremendous amount of damage, but I, I tell my guests, we were so lucky in Napa that we only lost 600 homes. Mm. It's ridiculous, only 600 homes. Whereas in Sonoma, right over that mountain, they lost 6,000 homes. Mm -hmm. So the, the impact to us was not so much felt within Napa because most of the fires were in the hillsides. Mm -hmm. And literally, we could have had guests coming back here by the third day, but they were so spooked by the national reports um, I know a lot of our competitors, a lot of our fellow guides were severely impacted. Many of them aren't in the business anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lull, fortunately about the time when we normally would have a lull during the year, which is around Thanksgiving to Christmas, and, but our business came back, but that has not been the case. And there are a lot of small wineries that we go to that will ask me when we go there, I said, Barry, um, what's it like in the rest of the valley? Because... Are you see, are, is everyone else as quiet as we are? And it's really taken a while to build that back up. So for goodness sakes, four weeks ago when this massive fire, even though it's practically halfway to Oregon, still that impacted our tourist business and scared, scared away, I'm sure, thousands and thousands of people. It kind of triggered me. And um, uh, it was, it was um, a little, and I, I don't know if I would say traumatic, but it... Um, it did upset me, and I could feel it in my body, actually, um, because it reminded me of what happened last year. And um, uh, just seeing the ash on the car, you know, going out to get into my car in the morning and having it covered in ash, mm. and um, 
it was, um, it bothered my throat. Um, and I have friends, a couple friends with asthma and they were triggered by it. So I think, um, it just, it, it triggered me because it reminded me of last year, this mm. time. Um, and that was a difficult time for you because you were working, I know at the time, and you have a young daughter who was out of school. Yeah, the kids were out of school for like two weeks when we had the fires in Napa. And um, that was kind of scary because we didn't have phone coverage, you know, so right. it was hard to get a hold of people. And then you don't know where the, the direction of the fires are going. So I think uh, for me personally, it just triggered memories. And that was... Um, upsetting you know uh for me and then just having to breathe uh the smoky air it just kind of settled in napa so um yeah i mean it's not something i grew up with well yeah because where do you go you know um so it's it's a stressful time but um you know, I think it's it's um, it's like we're getting used to it. It's mm. becoming a common thing here. So um, you just adjust. You know? that, that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not. Yeah. What we're going to see happen, I hope, because of the global climate impact of CO2, is a major shift in what we use for building materials. Mm. Right now we use fiberglass insulation, foam insulation. If you look at the petrochemicals, the amount of energy that that takes, if we build a building with that and we're trying to reduce climate change, it's like trying to lose weight and say, I'll gain 50 pounds first. The amount that you put in your building is huge. So you can use sheep wool, you can use rock wool, you can use used cellulose insulation, ground up newspapers and cardboard. And it does just as good a job and it reduces the impact absolutely dramatically. So what we're gonna see is forest being grown for that sort of thing again. So it'll really be more for a sustainable force, sustainable building, so it could contribute versus a conflict, which is how we viewed it in the past. I think you had lots of potential for that. Now, coincidentally, during all this time, you became the director of Napa Valley. Yeah, Napa Valley oh. Yoga Center. So my husband and I bought a yoga studio, and it was like right around the time of the camp fires. Um, just shortly before that, we took over ownership. And so we really try to create this as like a, like a refuge and a place where people could come, enjoy our filtered air, and focus on uh, peace and uh, finding a restful space within during very, very stressful times. Right. And so much of yoga has to do with how one controls one's breath. It's fundamentally a breath practice. So it just felt like this was a place that people could come and just breathe deeply uh, into that space and you know the air was clear inside and just be together because it was very stressful even when those fires weren't right next to us right. you know this year people were very um, kind of agitated and stressed out during that time yeah the fires were 100 miles away but we could smell them we could see them uh, yeah we could smell it and see it 24 hours a day and mm. it was just very uh, it just brought a gloomy pall mm. over the the whole area and some of our desk staff were commenting on how the smoke was affecting them. Mm. And I, my heart reached out to them because it was affecting me personally and physically so deeply. Um, so to hear them uh, complain of the phys same physical symptoms I was having and just sort of the, um, the, the gloomy atmosphere, it was just sort of bringing everybody down a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're burn Ralph, after three weeks... Yeah. Unless I pointed out where it was, we're driving along. I said, what? Everything looks pretty good. I said, well, look way up on that top of that mountain and look way over the top of that mountain. And you can see where the fires just uh, were, were ringing this valley. But the actual damage, what, out of 700 wineries in both, mm -hmm. both sides, there were, I think, two mm -hmm. that were destroyed. You would, you would have thought this place was a crater, right. Hiroshima, the way, the way people reacted to it. So unfortunately, it was bad. Um, bad publicity and um, Signorello, that's the one I was yes. trying to remember. Yes. The pictures of Signorello that first morning were, were broadcast out and that did more to impact our business than probably any, any, anything else, any other report because they had that one image that just looked so horrible. Mm -hmm. I know the winery was fine. It was wonderful. <laughs> the were fine. Yeah, we can be very sanguine about it because it wasn't our property that was damaged, right, but yes. still the actual damage versus the, the PR was um, was disproportionate, and that's yeah. it, it. It took a long time to come back, and there are a lot of wineries 
and as I said, our fellow guides that just didn't make it, yeah. did, didn't make it through. And then in your work as a healer, how has this affected your clients? Oh, wow, just everybody comes in with uh, lung issues, um, congestion, sinuses. What I find mostly is sinuses because that's the first defense. Mm. And, they, and then the smoke gets to them. And what they don't understand is it's just not just the smoke. It's everything else that burns when homes burn and cars burn and all the chemicals in your home. Just imagine all that's going up into the atmosphere and it has to come back down. And what are you recommending for people? Because I know you do you do fairly sophisticated breathing techniques. What are right. you been recommending for your, your, your clients? I, uh, I suggest to the clients that they uh, invest in a uh, really high quality air filter uh, or an air purifier and then also that they um, get a humidifier and a possible essential oil such as eucalyptus, peppermint, um, will help to kind of cleanse the air and you can put that in those diffusers you can buy. Um, there's sev several supplements that are recommended that have been known to help. Ginger, I have been told that also N-acetylcysteine, uh, NAC, uh, the firefighters use that. Mm. And they're exp because they're always exposed to smoke. Breathing exercise. I would suggest, <clears throat> like I said, during the smoke and the way it was, um, just try to stay indoors as much as but, possible. But how about afterwards? Afterwards, yeah, because, definitely. You know, have the residual effects. There's the um, there's uh, soma breath. Um, there's a yogic breath. Um, basically, just breathing. You know, inhale four, hold four, exhale eight. It's very good for the nervous system. If you want to kind of up it and get more oxygen, quicken that pace to an inhale of one, two, exhale, one, two, three, four, and just continue that, um, you know, five, ten minutes. It really starts energizing your body, helps the lungs to um, get, get oxygen in there, utilize the oxygen. As it is, we don't breathe enough. We don't use, utilize our diaphragm, which is so key to our real breath situations. You know, I need to do more research about how to, to heal the lungs. Um, I read that the effects of some of the heavy metals and chemicals in the smoke, uh, that they can have long-term effects. And I'm not sure that a, a short-term intervention would necessarily even undo that damage. Mm -hmm. The best thing that I could do for myself during that time was to wear the mask, and then by taking hot, steamy showers, I was hopeful that maybe my lungs could just naturally purge some of the toxins before they entered my system more deeply. I, I was touring with a, a husband and wife who were in the energy business back in, uh, back in Colorado. And, I, and they said, well, uh, how's this going with the, your public utility? I said, well, PG&E learned from their experience last year, where at first they said, oh, it was lightning, oh, it was acts of God, maybe they were arsonists. That went on for a while until it finally determined that it was the repeaters, the circuit breakers that had really caused that fire. And um, PG&E, to their, to their benefit, I think, or, or to their credit, um, they, they made an announcement that first morning of the fire. Uh, we've had an event. We've had some power lines that have had some problems. And guess what? 15 minutes later, that's where the fire had started. So they've been very, very forthcoming. Anyway, these, these people that I toured, they said, Oh yeah, our friends uh, are saying it's really impacting them. I said, oh, what, what do your friends do? And they said, oh, they run PG&E. Oh. So this was, their personal friends were the, the chairman and his wife of, of PG&E. They're, they're girding their loins for $30 billion worth of claims. Mm. But um, this is uh, unfortunate that these things started the way they did because all they would have needed to have done, we learned later, all they needed to have done was turn off these repeaters during the fire season, which many public utilities do anyway. I think the cost of PG&E doing that, they go, what's the worst that can happen? You know, let's not turn these off and then turn them back on in the spring. Uh, so that's how it happened. The irony of zero net energy buildings, which I've been working on for decades, is that to get zero net energy, the most common strategy is make uh, it well insulated, which is a really good thing. But when you use extra foam to do that, what you're doing is making the impact of that building by 2020, by 2050, three times worse than if you didn't had just a, of a plain old cold building. So we're doing things that are really unintentionally 
adding the carbon very up front, and it's exactly the wrong thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. But these are so ensconced in Europe and other places, in mm -hmm. Australia, some places where some of these come from, that it's standard practice there. This mm -hmm. is like, we're just so slow on making the comparison. So we have false equivalence of what it, what an insulation does for you. We say it saves energy. Well, if it's adding that carbon mm -hmm. by the one product and way less on another, that's an important thing we haven't looked at and that's key. And so we should be selecting the entire embodied carbon of the building materials plus the operational carbon and mm -hmm minimizing it and particularly the upfront things because right now we're on this tipping point i mean just last week we were way over the 1.5 uh threshold last week and you know that we'll be able to maintain that target is is really really unlikely mm -hmm. the way we're seeing things go that's true that's true i mean people uh, are missing one third of the silverado country club properties because those things burned all in one night yeah. Uh, that, that, that was so sad. We had a lot of friends who just thought the fire had been finished the first few days. The wind shifted whoosh, and it came through and that's, that's when most of our homes in, in Napa were destroyed was that the second phase of the fire that happened three or four days later. Because it's not healthy and it's going to cost us a hundredfold more and a thousandfold in human suffering, mm. which we don't need to do. We just need good planning or citizens to wake up and insist, insist that the normal structure that hangs on, that wants the oil and wants us to continue, just get voted out. You know, mm. we're gone. You're not doing that anymore. We won't let you. That's mm. a wake up call that's more visual, more of the heart than of the mind. We've been arguing, and for me, I've been uh, instructing people and showing actual demonstration, real data that we can change the codes with. But that's such a slow process. We need a wake up. And I think it's when you can change someone's heart so they knew it's the right thing to do, that this is essential for your grandkids, for everyone we know, then your heart beat away to discuss how do we do it and get off the dock and out of confusion into action. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to endorse the the Finnish system of raking leaves, but um, I, I think I think that the the problem is we're in a we're in an environment we're in an ecosystem that for millions of years has regenerated with fire. We have uh, sequoias, we have oak trees, we have pine trees. All of these regenerate every thirty or forty years when forest fires come through. And they do three things. They clear out the brush, which is positive. They drop ash, which is a form of fertilizer. And um, they'll, the, the heat allows the trees to pop and send out their seeds. So if they just dropped their, their pine cone seeds right below, they wouldn't germinate. So bam, 30, 40, 50 feet. That's what this flora is designed. That, that's how it regenerates. So the only difference lately is that we haven't been building million dollar houses in that environment mm -hmm. because it's worked fine for, for millennia mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and still will. That's California. That's, that's the reality of California. Well, what I notice is that when people are stressed, like any time we're stressed, our autonomic nervous system changes. So we go into the fight or flight. So that, that pattern, I have ways to, to uh, assess uh, and see that if they're into the autonomic nervous system. So once you get into that, all the other issues that you've had before will start coming up. So tension in the neck, shoulders, um, old aches and pains, those kind of issues will start coming because the body now is in stress mode. First thing I do is, uh, especially with the PTSD or any of those issues like that, is work on the autonomic nervous system, get them out of the sympathetic and back into parasympathetic. Mm. And then once they can calm the nervous system, then give them some breathing exercises and then work on the body. In other words, move them from <coughs> fight or flight back exactly. into rest and digest. Rest and digest yeah. and relax. That's the most important thing. And then re re you know, recommend that they drink plenty of water, get fluids. Mm. The lungs are actually the biggest or the, the organ that is the most important for detoxification. It goes lungs, kidneys, large intestine, of course our liver as well, but our lungs, we're, we're breathing in thousands of breaths a day. Right. And we're, you know, and so it really impacts our ability to cleanse our blood. So it's important to breathe 
and the breath work actually is the only way to really jump into the parasympathetic that's the fight or flight or the rest digest so it's through the breath that we can actually get out of fight or flight into rest and digest and it's long deep exhales and then shorter inhales most of us will when we're in the fight or flight our na natural reaction is that's fight or flight it's long deep exhales focusing on the exhale and then big deep breaths that has been proven through the um, <clears throat> Wim Hof method soma breath the uh, heart the, the uh, heart math Institute the breath work is the key that's wonderful thank you James you're welcome thank great. you Ralph uh, we are now reaping the um, the effects of you know, 100 years of forest management that uh, there was different strategies on how to manage forests in the past and they were doing the best that they could. Um, but now we know that by letting things, or by stopping burns, it makes the subsequent burns bigger. And then also we're in this period of uh, climate change where things are, in California, have just been drier and warmer for the last few years. Um, that's just a fact and then that has an effect on the way the, the trees are mm -hmm are growing and the way that they are becoming more susceptible to fire. Mm -hmm. So I think right now it, it, damage control would be on just focusing on not building in fire prone areas. Mm -hmm. You know, fire, forest management is extremely complex mm -hmm. and you know, the, the ultimate forest manager is mother nature. Yes. She does it right mm -hmm. every single time. And there are always going to be burns. That is how mother nature manages the forest mm -hmm. and how the forest renews and how the, the forest gets rid of um, older, drier uh, trees, and when we come in and short, and short circuit the way Mother Nature does it, uh, there's always going to be side effects, mm -hmm. and that's uh, unfortunate. In researching this episode, I have found other ways we can control the frequency and severity of these fires, besides driving electric cars and feeding kelp to cows. Forest management matters, and that's done mostly through logging which was massively reduced in California by excessive regulations. Two power plants once ran entirely on lumber industry scraps. Something we use here in wine country are herds of goats foraging in the woods. They remove flammable tinder while increasing the land's ability to retain water by 50%. So many winery properties here are mostly forests, with a fraction of their land and vineyard. They need to manage their forests more productively and profitably. People need to get used to the sounds of lumber equipment, goat spraying, and other old-fashioned solutions, because those sounds mean spending less time breathing smoke and picking up the pieces of burned homes. For Wine Country at Work, this is Ralph Demetrius.